Welcome to the upper limb block party. So this session is going to cover the upper limb plan A blocks plus a little bit more. It was going to include the some distal arm blocks, radial, median and ulnar nerve blocks, uh, but it just made the session a bit too long. So I'm going to record those separately as an extra little bonus block party. So first of all, if you wouldn't mind just scanning that QR code or going to that web address and um, just pause the video for a minute. Um, and it would be great if you could just fill out those few pre-teaching questions. It just gives us some really useful information. So thank you very much. And then I'll carry on. So this session is going to cover the, this is just a reminder of the, the plan A blocks here in this column and the plan, so-called plan B, C, D blocks over on this side. So this session is going to cover the upper limb plan A blocks, which are the interscaling brachial plexus block and the axillary brachial plexus block. We'll also cover the supraclavicular block just because that's supraclavicular brachial plexus block because although that's not a plan A block um, I think we do quite a lot of them and it's an, it's an important one to cover. So I always find just thinking or looking up a, a map of the cutaneous kind of nerve distribution before you plan a block for a particular procedure is quite useful um, just to remind you what, co what covers what. A couple of interesting things just to note from these these maps. This area here on the kind of inner upper arm is actually covered by the intercostobrachial nerve, which isn't a branch of the brachial plexus at all. That's actually a branch of T2. So any brachial plexus block that you do is not going to cover that area. So it's just something to bear in mind for things like um, renal access lists, for example, where the grafts they use, the, the procedures they perform often go, go up quite high into the upper arm here. So whether the surgeon needs to just top up with local as they go or whether you can do a subcutaneous kind of sausage under the skin up here to try and cover that intercostobrachial nerve, whatever you do you just need to think, think about a way of getting around that. Um, another interesting thing just to, to mention while we're here, for example I used to think well why can't you just do some blocks in the forearm and everything distal to that goes numb so for a hand for hand surgery, why can't you just block the forearm? Um, it doesn't necessarily work. For example, things like the musculocutaneous nerve here, which covers this whole area right down to the wrist, um, branches off the, the brachial plexus right up quite high up in the axilla around here. So if you just performed distal nerve blocks down here, you wouldn't cover that area. Also, the radial nerve branches above the elbow into superficial and deep branches. And the, the deep branch goes on to supply a lot of the deep, deep and bony tissue of the hand. So if you just performed a superficial radial nerve block in the forearm, that wouldn't be covered. Um, so just some things to think about there. I also quite like to kind of picture where exactly on, along the plexus are, are we blocking. So for example, the interscalene block is performed generally around the level of the roots around here. The supraclavicular block kind of at the the, the border between trunks and divisions. But so you might see trunks or you might see divisions or a bit of both on your ultrasound picture because you're performing the block around here. The infraclavicular block we won't cover in this session. And then the auxiliary block is all the way down at the terminal branches of the plexus down here. So you can actually pick out the individual, the individual branches. So first of all, the interscaling brachial plexus block. Indications would be surgery to the shoulder or upper arm technique covered in the table here so it talks about a supine position which we'll cover which we'll discuss in a second using a linear probe it's a very shallow block generally and generally only needs about a 50 millimeter needle and a transverse plane we'll talk about an in-plane approach with the needle and volume and concentration and com uh, combination of local might would depend whether you're going for analgesia or anesthesia so just a couple of pictures here showing the different setups. So this would be a supine setup with the patient's head turned to the other side. The only issue here is often sometimes that the, there's not enough space necessarily to fit the needle and your hand, um, the pillow or the bed um, getting in the way there. Sometimes it's easier to turn the patient lateral, get, get, themselves to turn them, get them to turn themselves lateral and it opens up the space here. Ergonomically can be easier and can open up the space a little bit more and give, give you a slightly better picture on the screen as well. In terms of where to find the best place to perform the block, one of the techniques to find the interscaling groove is to initially start with a view of, the, of, the, of a supraclavicular block. So this is the kind of view 
which we'll, come, we'll discuss in more detail with the supraclavicular block, but kind of view that you'd have. So this is plonking the probe kind of on top of the clavicle in the supraclavicular fossa. You find in the artery here, that's your kind of main landmark, and then the plexus is all of this and a bit up here. It's kind of triangular shape, that's the brachial plexus at that level, with the rib, first rib behind, and the pleura and lung all the way down here. So you'd start with that kind of view and then move up the neck, keeping the plexus in view. Slide slowly up the neck until you find the interscalene groove with the nerve settling in there. So just to go back over that a little bit, if you keep your eye on the, this bit of plexus tissue up here, that kind of forms the superior trunk, falls into the interscalene groove and divides it. Then you can clearly see C5 and C6 certainly in that groove. So that's a good way of just find, getting your, your bearings to start with. So focusing in on that kind of picture a little bit more, a bit of a blurry picture, but we'll start highlighting some structures to see, to see what's what. So first of all, you can see here this kind of classic, what they call the traffic light pattern. So common misconception is to think that that's C5, 6 and 7, but actually the top route there would be C5. Those two are both C6, so C6 is typically a kind of bifid um, structure, it comes in two chunks essentially, and then C7 would be way down here. You can actually see C7 tr transverse process here, which would be, and then the, the nerve root coming out at that level. And we'll go, we'll go into a bit, bit more detail on the transverse processes in a second as well. But there's the, the roots of the plexus basically in the groove between anterior scalene and middle scalene with sternocleidomastoid up there. And as I said, the C7 transverse process can be seen down deep to C7 there. Um, the reason why people will often say, keep, you know, keep your needle up in this area, don't go chasing C7 with your needle, trying to get a good C7 block, is because the vertebral artery is often down here somewhere, next to, often just next to C7. Um, and if you go back to the blank picture, it's not necessarily that obvious to see unless you put Doppler on, in which case you probably would identify it. But I'm pretty sure that that's the artery down there. So you wouldn't want to just go fishing around down there quite deep with a needle. So best to keep your, keep your needle up superficially, much safer. So performing the block, we'll just highlight C5 and 6 there again. Then bring the needle in from the right of the screen here, which is posterior. Different things say to, different kind of books and resources say to try and go just under C6 or just under C5, between 5 and 6. Just pop through very gently that fascial layer into the, gro into the interscalene groove and aim for a local distribution, something like that. Now, the, the more local you put in and the more anterior spread you get on the anterior aspect of the plexus, you, the more likely you are to get a phrenic nerve block. So the phrenic nerve travels over the, from the interscalene groove over here, over, as you go down the neck, travels over the anterior scalene muscle more anteriorly. So it might be that structure there heading off that way. So you can imagine as you get more, more local anteriorly and more volume generally in that groove, it spills over and comes up here and you're more likely to get a phrenic nerve block. So actually keeping the local as posterior as possible and limiting the volume as much as possible helps to avoid that. Just another way of identifying which route is which um, and just some nice scanning practice is to try and find the transverse processes mm -hmm. that are associated with each nerve root. So for example, this here is the C5 transverse process, this little cup shape. And there you can see the C5 nerve root just sitting in the little cup. So it's quite easy, quite nice way of identifying which is which. So we'll just trace around the C5 transverse process and the C5 nerve root sitting in that cup. Then down to the C6, so a slightly wider cup, but still a kind of cup shape. There, and then with the C6 nerve root sitting inside the cup. So again, we'll just trace around C6 there and the nerve root there. So C6 classically has a 
more prominent anterior tubercle to the transverse process, which is known as Chassagnac's tubercle. So that's the slightly more, slightly more chunky anterior tubercle, whereas the posterior tubercle is a bit more, um, a bit kind of less prominent there. If we went back to C5, you notice that C5 has a more prominent posterior tubercle and not much of an anterior tubercle. So C5 has a more prominent posterior, C6 has a more prominent anterior. Then if we go further down the neck to C7, that has a basically only has a big posterior tubercle and then pretty much no anterior tubercle. And then the C, big chunky C7 root is sitting at that level coming out there as well. This is just a little video showing, of showing that in a dynamic kind of way. So starting quite low, we'll have, first of all, we'll come up to C7 vertice transverse process there, then up to C6, that wider cup, and then further up the neck to C5, that smaller cup. So C5 there, coming back down to C6, and then coming back down again to C7. And you can see the corresponding nerve root coming out and entering the uh, kind of in scaling groove coming out from the from the uh, from the vertebra at each level at each of those levels. Okay, moving on to the axillary brachial plexus block. So indications would be surgery to the forearm and hand technique in the box. So generally supine position with the arm abducted and elbow flexed. So that tends to be something like something in in the area of kind of getting the patient's head behind their, sorry, hand behind their head. I find that can actually, that can be a bit uncomfortable and stretch the brachial plexus a little bit and they can get some tingling in their fingers if they're too strained like that. So actually bringing the elbow down a little bit more so the elbow's at more of a right angle um, is a little bit more comfortable for the patient. Again, a linear probe. Again, it's quite a superficial block. So one to four centimetres, it says here. 50 or maybe 80 millimeter needle because there's a little bit more kind of needling and needle maneuvering to do with this block so you might need the extra length of the 80 millimeter again we'll talk about an inver in, sorry in plane approach and again the volume of local would depend whether you're going for analgesia or anesthesia um, generally kind of 20 to 25 mils gives you a fairly would normally give you a fairly reliable block so that's again just a picture of the set up as you can see here the hand patient's hand isn't quite under their head their arms nice and in a nice relaxed position they can stay there for five or ten minutes while you do the block and it still gives you good access to the to the axilla here so trying to line everything up as in a straighter line as possible you might want the ultrasound machine on this side of the patient depending where you want to stand and how you want to line things up trying to get everything in a straight line so it's nice and ergonomical so just to run over the anatomy of the block. So this would be the kind of view that you'd get once you plonk your probe on in that position. With this being the superior, so the top side, Ooh, sorry. And then this being the inferior. So with the needle would be coming in from the right, the right side of the screen here. So ideally you want to aim, the first landmark you want to find really is your axillary artery. And then you want to find a level where you get this nice, obvious, thick conjoint tendon, which is the conjoint tendon of latissimus dorsi and triceps. So you, and you use that as your kind of backstop to the block, to the needle. Then the, identifying the nerves can be a little bit tricky, especially just on a single shot photo like this. Um, but essentially the normal pattern is having the radial nerve kind of behind the artery normally often kind of lying flat against the conjoint tendon and then the configuration is, is normally r-u-m so rum a good way to remember it would be rum radial back here the next one around is ulna which can be further this way a bit higher up further back here but generally in this kind of area and then median would be this route here in this picture which again could be a bit higher could be a bit further this way could be a bit more on top of the artery but generally in that kind of configuration of RUM. You also have musculocutaneous nerve which we mentioned earlier which comes off the plexus a little bit kind of in the axilla slash just above the axilla and then tends to travel away through this muscle which is coracobrachialis through this fascial plane 
and as you scan down the arm, which we'll see in a minute, it kind of swims away through along that plane of muscle. We've also got some axillary, some veins. So the axilla is normally quite a, a vascular um, region, lots of veins. So you've just got to be aware where these veins are, particularly because um, depending on probe pressure, they could easily be obliterated if you're holding the, pr the probe quite for, you know, with a bit more pressure. Um, so you wouldn't know that they're there. So you want to just relax the probe pressure and find out where those veins are. Muscle under the tendon is triceps. And then as we said, coracobrachialis on this side. So this is just a photo showing the difference with a bit more pro, pro pressure. Suddenly these two big veins at the top here are pretty much obliterated and you wouldn't necessarily know, know they were there. So just something to be aware of. Okay, this is a, it's not the best video to show this, but best way of identifying which nerve is which I find is just scanning, a bit of dynamic scanning from the axilla kind of down towards the elbow and then back up again. So if we focus on what we think is the median nerve here, now the, the median is the one that generally sticks next to the artery as, as you go down the arm. So if you focus on this trunk, this nerve, sorry, there as we go down, so it's still here next to the artery, slowly going down the arm. Stays next to the artery the whole way. And it's still there right next to the artery. So we can go back, for, we can go back up the arm you know, it might roll over from one side to the other, but it generally sticks next to the artery. You can go back up the arm, back up to the axilla. Mm -hmm. And it's there, and then we know that that's, so we know that that's median. So if we watch the ulnar nerve, which was basically right next to the median, which was, we think this nerve here. So as we go down the arm, it sticks, they stick fairly close together for a little while. But then the ulnar nerve starts to separate. It starts to separate away on its own, as you can see here. And stays superficial in the arm, separates away from the artery and the median nerve. So that's a reliable way of find, okay, identifying that's definitely the ulnar, trace it back up into the axilla. And then we can see exactly where it settles. That's why the video is a bit all over the place. So we know we can confirm that, okay, that's definitely the ulna. Now the radial is a little bit tricky. You get often, you get this post cystic enhancement on the ultrasound on the other side of um, the artery. So everything kind of, you always think the nerve is right just below the artery because it's the brightest bit, but that's often just an artifact of the ultrasound. But you know that it's in this kind of area underneath the artery and we can try and watch, you need a bit more depth than this really to, find, to trace radial. But we, as we trace down the arm, we can try and watch radial generally dives down deep, comes down deep, and then wraps around, will come down this side of the humerus and wrap around the humerus in the spiral groove. Sorry, I don't know what happened to the video there. Back onto this one. So we're watching radial. And it'll dive down deep and wrap around the humerus. It's probably somewhere down here, traveling down. And then as we scan back up the arm in a second, so watching something coming up from down here. As we, as we come up in a second, <laughs> okay, coming back up. So we see something here. You can convince yourself that's radial coming up, coming up. It's not the greatest video. And then eventually you can convince yourself where it settles which is generally in that kind of area behind the artery. And then much easier to trace is the muscular cutaneous. So this is the one here that we were saying kind of swims away in this fascia as we go down the arm. Then as we go back up again, swims back up towards the plexus in that fascia of cor coracobrachialis. So a decent block site for the auxiliary block would be ideally where you can block all four of those nerves with one skin entry point. You might, it doesn't matter if you need two, if you need to adjust slightly and have and use two entry points, but it's quite nice and smooth if you can just use one. 
So the first way I would do it, so just to re just to relabel the nerves there. I'm coming with the needle from the right side. Try and get muscular cutaneous on the way in. So surround that with some local if you can get into that fascial plane, that'll open up nicely. Then I'd carry on past that and come under the artery and very gently popping through this fascia and hydro dissecting as you go. Aim to essentially fill that space with local. And as you do, the radial nerve will probably become a lot, suddenly become a lot more obvious as it lifts up off the conjoint tendon and is surrounded by local. And you can kind of chase your needle in as you hydro, hydro dissect, you can chase your needle up into the space you create um, and make sure you feel, you know, you filled that space and you've definitely got radial nerve at least with that needle pass. I'd then come out and re-angle and go more superficial. I'd go in this example, probably just above the artery, under the median nerve, heading towards the ulna, but obviously not into it or onto it. Again, hydro dissecting as you go, so opening up space as you as you edge your needle into that space that you've created and essentially make sure that you cover ulna nerve initially with that needle pass all the way through there. And then as you withdraw the needle, you can inject more and cover median nerve and essentially aiming for that whole area to be to be full of local. You might then want to have to re-angle re and go above median nerve again just to make sure that you've covered the top area. And that should do nicely. Okay, so that's, those are the two plan A blocks, but then moving on to the, to, onto the supraclavicular block, brachial plexus block, which we do perform quite regularly as well. Um, so this is often called the spinal of the arm, I think essentially because that's because there is potential doing this for really kind of dense rapid onset block where the whole arm just goes completely numb and, and floppy very quickly. So it's appropriate for surgery from the mid humerus to all the way down to the distal hand. The technique would be having the patient kind of supine slash semi sitting, the head turned away and then I've put here reaching for the ipsilateral knee so you essentially just want the shoulder kind of down and out of the way as much as possible so if you ask the patient to to reach for their their knee on that side and then relax their arm in that position that that can often work again you'd use the linear transducer the, it'll be transverse on the neck so in this that supraclavicular fossa just uh, just above the midpoint of the clavicle very superficial again only a few centimeters probably an 80 millimeter needle would be the most appropriate we'll talk about an in-plane approach and again 20 to 25 mils around the plexus in this area would should be enough to give a nice a nice reliable block so it's that kind of position your probe just lying in that supraclavicular fossa here and the needle coming in from this side which again will be the right side of the screen so back to this picture where we started the scaling block as well so this is the, essentially the picture you want for a supraclavicular block. So artery is your main landmark here. And then you want to find a place where you can confidently say that, that you've got the first rib sitting under the artery because that's your kind of safety backstop for your needle to make sure that you're not going to go anywhere near the pleura and the lung, which are down here. The plexus is this triangular kind of structure coming, sitting beside the artery. And just, again, it's difficult on a, single single image but scanning up and down you find that sometimes there might be a little bit of plexus mm. up here as well or over here or something that's not in this nice little triangle so just to label that you've got the artery there plexus there and there first rib there and the pleura and lung underneath down there and then you've got a vein over there so to block that different things you read say different advise different techniques um, to get a one one technique is to basically triangulate the, the plexus with local not actually enter the plexus this is all kind of this the plexus within a within a sheath of its own one technique is to what, surround the plexus with local um, by having one needle pass kind of underneath the plexus one above there and essentially trying to surround surround the plexus with local like that I think that might work reasonably well for analgesia. It might take quite a long time for that local to work it to kind of diffuse in and affect the nerves that are right in the middle of the plexus. And it might not give you dense enough analgesia for awake surgery, for example. You'd have to do another needle pass just to surround that bit of plexus up there. So the other technique 
particularly if you want this is where you'd get the spinal of the arm um effect and if you particularly if you want to do a wake surgery i think you're more likely to have to go into the plexus itself obviously very very carefully so there's a lot of nerve tissue in here you pick a pick a little area where you think there aren't any nerve roots right in front of you very delicately advance into the fascia into the plexus here and aiming to to, to fill the area with local like that the most commonly missed area with supraclaviculars is down here it's what called what they call the corner pocket which has often the kind of ulnar nerve uh, or, or the fibers that end up being the ulnar nerve right down in the corner here so you you should you might want to hydro dissect your way through so injecting little bits of local and advancing advancing the needle into the space that you're creating to get all the way down here to make sure you've got local spreading kind of under the artery and all the way into that corner um, and you might have to just re-angle your needle slightly to make sure you, you're getting local all the way up here as well. Sometimes um, it spreads really nicely just from one point, but sometimes you might have to manoeuvre the needle a bit. Um, but always kind of hydro dissecting as you go and making sure that you're, you're never advancing your needle onto nerve tissue itself. And again, in this example, in this picture, you'd have to just do another needle pass to make sure that you've surrounded that bit of plexus there. It's so another image just showing the same thing essentially, but in a different patient. The plexus is all nicely together in this example, this big chunky area. So to block that for a kind of spinal of the arm effect, you'd want to get into the plexus and as we say, work your way into the corner here, maybe up here, etc. But aiming essentially for local to spread throughout that, that area. Okay, so just a reminder, We've covered the plane upper limb blocks being the interscalene and the auxiliary brachial plexus blocks. And we've also talked about the supraclavicular block. Go away and do loads of blocks. You might one day be as cool as these, these guys. And please, if you don't mind, it would be really useful. Again, just pause the video, scan the QR code or go to the web address and um, fill out the post teaching questionnaire. Same questions and just a couple of extra um, compared to the pre-teaching one and that's really really useful for us so thank you very much and I'll stop the recording there